Hey, everybody, welcome. Uh, so, um, for the first time ever, we're trying to do this live not only on uh, Zoom, Zoom, but also on Facebook, which means that pretty much anything could go wrong. Um, and uh, in fact, there's actually a chance that everything has already gone wrong. So, with that in mind, we will launch into today's talk. So, um, uh, in particular, I want to welcome um, uh, a number of our Amazir friends um, who've joined us today. Um, and uh, the subject today, as you know, is Tifina, the once and future alphabet. So, I use the phrase the once and future alphabet with reference, um, of course, to T.H. White's book, The Once and Future King, which refers to King Arthur and also obliquely to Jesus Christ. So there is actually um, a, a remarkable number of cultures around the world who in their own narrative about themselves refer to a previous state of um, greater respect, greater authority, greater land ownership. And in fact, I have this saying that an endangered alphabet is often a sign of a lost kingdom. So for example, in um, Southeast Asia, Zomia, South China, that area, there are a number of people, um, the, the Hmong, um, the Karen people, the Thai people, who have in their cultural narrative stories of a time when they were once respected, they were once more powerful, they once owned their own land, and they've fallen or been driven um, from that state of grace. Um, usually as a result of um, military um, action, misfortune, etc. So one of the really interesting differences between the, um, the experience then of the, um, uh, the people I'm talking about in Southeast Asia and the, um, the Amazigh people of North Africa is that the Amazigh people have evidence. So what we're looking at for the next three slides are stones, uh, stele, really substantial stones that have been found um, in North Africa, especially Northwest Africa, with writing on them that demonstrates visually um, that the Amazigh culture has been in North Africa, or initially in an area from the western borders of what we now call Egypt, as far as the Canary Islands, for 2,000 years and more. And this notion of writing as evidence is a really interesting and rather complex one. Um, for example, in uh, Vermont, where I live, in the, the northern area of New England up by the Canadian border in the United States, one of the um, arguments that's been held against the indigenous people here um, and was held for decades, um, actually centuries, is that they don't deserve official status because there is no evidence that they have lived here and predated the European settlers. And by evidence, of course, um, one of the things that um, people have meant is writing. We say, I'm gonna put it down in black and white. I'd like to see it in writing. There is a very strong and long and often a kind of dark history of writing as evidence. In the Chittagong Hill Tracks of Bangladesh, um, settlers have been moved into land that has been farmed by indigenous people for centuries because the claim is, do you have evidence you own this land? Do you have land deeds? If not, 
then what evidence is there that you've been here all this, this time and you own this land? We're gonna give it to somebody else. So this notion of, of evidence is a very powerful and often um, abused one. But in this case, there's no doubt that we can see this writing um, in a script called uh, Libico Berber. Berber. Um, going back, as I say, a good 2000 years and more, um, coexisting with Phoenician and some of the oldest writing systems in um, Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. And um, it's this, when I say the once and future alphabet, this is the once end. And um, so um, this writing um, in a script that um, subsequently became known as Tifana, um, is uh, the Amazir um, evidence that we were here, we were here in a way that um, can be identified with civilization because writing and civilization are so closely identified with each other. And we are here over a large um, area and for a long period of time. So this is writing as sort of ancestral evidence. Now, of course, what happened since then is precisely what has happened to many cultures throughout the world. Um, so first of all, part of this, um, uh, the Amazigh territory is um, taken over by Romans and then subsequently most, if not all of it is overrun by the Arabs. And then much more recently, um, you have colonial incursions by the French. And all of these um, cultures have done what um, powerful cultures have done throughout history, which is to marginalize the people who they've, they've conquered and um, to um, kind of overwrite, and I use this word advisedly, to overwrite their story and their history with the history of the newcomers. Another phrase you'll hear me say a lot in this series is that history is written by the winners in the alphabet of the winners. But one of the really interesting things about minority scripts or endangered alphabets, whatever you want to call it, is that um, because the powerful, the invaders, the, the colonizers, are really interested in fertile plains and cities, it means that um, the indigenous or traditional cultures that were there first really um, find their strongholds or their refuge in the land that the more powerful don't want. So in the uh, case of um, the Inuit, it's the far north where it's really cold. In the case of the Philippines, it's the outlying islands where um, the indigenous cultures and their writing systems have survived uh, the longest. And in North Africa, it's in the mountains and in the desert. So the mountains and the desert then provide a kind of um, haven for um, the writing system that you see here and its descendants. In fact, it's the Tuareg women who um, keep this script alive. They use it in um, tattoos, they use it in jewelry, they teach it to their children. And um, this is how it survives in an underground or um, at least a remote um, and less hospitable um, environment as the cities, the small towns are um, dominated first by the Arab culture, subsequently by the French culture. And they themselves define as civilized their own writing, their own literature, their own cultural practices, their own art forms, etc. cetera. Um, and so you have the Amazigh culture, which ironically in some of the countries in North Africa is not a minority, but a majority is treated like a, a, a minority, is treated like a less civilized um, culture. So what happens then is um, a revival. 
and a revival which has some very, very interesting um, features. And so the reason why I've called this the once and future alphabet is really because I'm looking at what does it take to revive a writing system? What is involved? What are the tools that you have at your disposal? What is the iconography? And then what are the practices that you need in order to engage in that degree of revival? So in the 1960s, um, you have a group of Amazia um, artists and journalists and writers, um, mostly in Paris, and they found what they call the Amazia Academy. And um, they do a lot of writing about Amazia culture, um, the degree to which it, uh, the Amazia have suffered marginalization, repression, even um, torture, um, execution. And um, so they think about, so how are we going to form a core of the Amazia identity when, okay, and this is really, really important. One of the common practices of a dominating culture is to divide and conquer. And so the question then becomes, how do we reunite? And so one of the ways that they reunite is by creating a flag. So this is the Amazia flag, which of course speaks to the desert, um, the, um, the more fertile land, the sky. But right in the middle of the flag is a letter. This is the, uh, the Tifanach letter Yaz, um, which also bears a resemblance to um, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man. There's a sense that this is us, this is who we are. And so it becomes one of the few cultures in the world which has so recognized the importance of its writing system that it is right there in the visual iconography of the flag. So we're used to the flag being a visual symbol that is supposed to unite a people um, and to, to create a, a sense of pride. And here we have both the flag as a visual symbol and the alphabet as a visual symbol because of course, it's the alphabet harking back to those stele or those stones that says, we have been here all along. So I mentioned the Abnaki, or the indigenous people of uh, Northern New England, Vermont, Southern Canada. So they have this saying, which is, we are still here. And it's a really interesting saying because you could have sayings that are more confrontational or more angry, um, but it's the one that says, don't ignore us, don't overlook us, don't pretend we're not here. We may not show up in your history books, but we are still here. And so um, as a manifestation um, of the presence of the Amazigh people, what we've started to see um, in the last essentially um, 15 years is visual evidence um, and acknowledgement that, oh yeah, the Amazigh people are here. And so here what we see is actually, this is the wall of a school um, up in the High Atlas Mountains um, that is actually the, um, the bike that I have rented for the day that is leaning against the character who looks somewhat like Bugs Bunny. Um, but here we have this manifestation. Um, and interestingly enough, this is sufficiently far out of the major cities that of the two principal sort of colonial official languages and scripts of Morocco, which are Arabic and French. Um, we don't see French. There's no Latin alphabet there, um, which is a sign that the French really did concentrate their influence in what they thought of as being the centers of civilization, namely the cities. So here, as you can see, we have Arabic and we have Tifina. Um, and here in the cities, we get, and so I was here 
uh, just over a year ago, and this sign was new. Uh, this is actually um, the airport in Casablanca. And so I believe, but you have to realize that I don't actually speak any of the endangered alphabet languages that I carve. This says uh, Mohammed V Airport um, in uh, right there in, in Tifanar script. So it's illuminated, it's in letters many feet tall. And this is now um, an official position of the Moroccan government that on government buildings, at least, you will start seeing the Tifanar um, alphabet. It isn't happening everywhere. Um, it isn't happening uh, uniformly, but it is a visible acknowledgement that yes, we are still here. So this really raises some fascinating questions about um, yes, all right, um, how do you actually go beyond what could easily be a kind of tokenism. Um, yes, this sign is here, but what is actually happening to pay respect to and give equality to Amazigh culture, Amazigh language, Amazigh script? Because the script, as we've seen already, is a visual manifestation of the identity and culture of the people. So yeah, what else is going on? So for example, here we are in Marrakesh. We have the Musée Berber. Um, and here, because it's in a city, we do see it in Tifana and in French and in Arabic. But here's the thing. Remember what I said, the, the, the Abenaki phrase was, we are still here. So we are still here is not the same thing as we are in a museum. It's not the same thing as we're in a history book. And for all that, it's a great thing when a governmental organization allocates funds for creating museum, it's all too possible for that to kind of corral off the entire memory and identity of the people as something that happened in the past. You can also be sure that a museum, especially one that's officially funded, may only tell certain aspects of the past. It may not talk about, for example, acts of genocide or acts of torture or other things that uh, may well be true, but might not be um, pleasant and um, might not be acknowledged. So here we are. If you want to go beyond the identity of a culture as being something that existed in the past, but is not really um, active today, how do you go about doing that? So one of the ways you do that is by creating ways of speaking to that culture wherever it may be. So um, this is um, on the left, myself, and on the right, Zuhir Az, who is the editor-in-chief of Amazir World News, which is an online news organization which speaks to and gives news to the Amazir people worldwide, the, the spread or diaspora of the people. Um, and there again, there's the Yaz, which I've, I've carved as a, as, a, as a gift for him, which is their identifying, yeah, this is it, this is we're still here. And so what Zuhir is doing is saying, again, if we are divided, we are conquered. Um, the purpose of a news organization is to try and reach out and provide information that is, in, is one form of unification. And here, this is in Rabat. Um, here we have uh, Le Monde Amazir, uh, which is a newspaper um, published um, out of Rabat. Um, by uh, Rashid Raha. Um, and so that is a way of, um, again, creating that sense of identity and community within the country. And um, I want to move on now to really, in a way, what is possibly the most important element in this notion of um, reviving and revitalizing the language, the script, the culture, which is teaching it. So 
Um, I've already posted on Facebook and on Twitter a number of photographs of um, uh, Amazir textbooks, which have been produced by IRCAM, which is a, a sort of a governmental organization in Morocco. So I'm not going to post those again. This is stuff that I actually only heard about a couple of days ago. And these are um, teaching materials that were produced in Libya. Now, Libya is a really interesting example because um, when Gaddafi um, was in charge of Libya, he is quoted as saying that if um, Amazia mothers give their children Amazia names, it's like giving them poison. Um, he was, um, one would say, fanatically um, anti Amazia. But since the revolution, there have been um, um, some pretty remarkable changes. Uh, especially in the provinces which are more um, Amazia majority, uh, which I believe are more in the south of the country, again, further into the desert. So what we have here, um, are we're going to see a series of slides from um, teaching books um, in Zifinar script, as you'll see here. Um, but th there are a number of things that I want to point out about these that go beyond um, just uh, when I say just, uh, that go beyond teaching the, the alphabet and the script. So the fact is that these need to exist because the single greatest problem facing most cultures that are trying to revitalize their language or their script is the shortage of teachers. Um, there may well be very few speakers. Those speakers may not be in a position to teach. They may not be very good teachers they may not have the materials to teach. And so supporting the act of teaching is crucial. And if that support is at all government funded, and I, I should point out that um, I believe the government paid for the printing of these books, but didn't pay for the time involved in developing them, the artwork, all this kind of stuff. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this creation of educational materials is crucial, but then also the kinds of materials that, that are produced are crucial. So one of the things that you see in the background here is that uh, there's an image of a traditional Amazir town. So when you're teaching indigenous or minority or marginalized kids, almost the first element is you have to ground them in their culture. And in a way, the bigger pitch that's going on here is that you may be teaching their language, but in a, in a kind of a more important sense, you're, you, you wanna be teaching them self-respect. You wanna be teaching respect and equality for their culture. Um, and so here we have the kid, the two kids in um, traditional um, garb and the background is, is familiar to them. And this, what, there's a great illustration of how important this is. So my friend Mong Nyu, who grew up as an ethnic minority Marma in the Chittagong Hill Tracts, um, when he managed to get um, a, a formal education by, by going away at a young age to a boarding school, one of the features of his education was that he um, was told to memorize William Wordsworth's poem, Daffodils. The fact is there are no daffodils in the Chittagong hill tracks of Bangladesh. He had no idea what this poet was rhapsodizing about. It would be years and years later when he finally saw a daffodil. So when you have that sense of a colonial culture or post-colonial cultural education, what it does is to undermine the self-belief and the identity of the kids. Uh, it makes them feel less than. So here is something really interesting about these, um, uh, these, these school books. So what you have here is an, is an illustration of indigenous kids of the world. So again, this is a way of attacking the divide and conquer notion. It's replacing it by saying, hey, we are all in this together. And the fact that we are Amazigh people, Amazigh kids um, in Libya, we're really part of this hands across the planet thing. 
And again, that's, uh, that's a kind of a, a radical, but really important notion in terms of granting um, marginalized people respect and equality, not only within their culture, but across the world. Um, here is another really interesting illustration. So what we have here is uh, an illustration of Christians and Jews. So even though in the culture where this book is going to be used, there are very few Christians and Jews, nevertheless, it's a way of saying, yes, we're all in this together. We're all included. Um, and uh, if you don't do that, then you're in danger of saying, of developing an attitude where they say, well, I'm only Libyan or I'm only Amazir or because the great cultures of the world are something else. And what this is saying is, no, we are all in this together. And this one and the next slide, which I'll show you in a minute, are also really interesting because both of them really provide a, a pro-environment message. And again, one of the really interesting aspects of divide and conquer is that it creates the notion that the traditional practices, which may well be farming practices, agricultural practices, nomadic practice or whatever, of an indigenous culture are somehow backward, are somehow primitive. And the real people in the world, the major cultures are industrialized. Um, and, and of course, as we all know, quite the reverse may well be true. The indigenous um, farming practices may actually be way more ecologically sound than, you know, Western industrial practices. But you've got to make that part of the message which says your culture matters. And here's one more where you've actually got tree and uh, planting and plant planting going on and traditional forms of agriculture going on. Um, so, um, what we're seeing then is that an endangered alphabet is a symptom. The cure is not simply to focus on that alphabet or that language, but to focus on that entire culture and to give respect and equality to that culture. But a crucial way of doing it is through writing, as we see here. And writing, as we've seen since the first slide, is this uh, manifestation of continuity and belonging. Um, and I'm gonna um, stop my screen sharing here and actually take over the screen myself, um, because there's just a couple of things that I wanna say to sort of wrap up here. Um, when I first started posting some of these um, recently created educational materials um, for Amazir children um, on Facebook, some people were, um, some Amazir people were posting and saying, yes, this is great. This is our alphabet. This is who we are, etc." And some people said, you know, um, you know, why bother? Um, we, um, we should be doing um, French and Arabic and we may even be threatening ourselves and, and the survival of our language by trying to reintroduce this script. And I want to say two things straight away. One is, it's not my job to tell you what to do. I know little or nothing, and I have absolutely no right or responsibility in anybody else's lives. Two, I'm also really well aware that there are many places in the world when indigenous rights movements are met by force. And I totally understand anybody who says, we don't wanna cause trouble because it'll just make things worse for ourselves. Again, it's not my job to judge that. But I do wanna point out a couple of things about the um, revival materials that I've been showing you, which have been primarily in Morocco and in Libya. The first is that 
there are many governments around the world who are answering calls for indigenous rights and especially the teaching of indigenous languages by saying it can't be done. And if nobody has ever seen it being done, then the argument it can't be done seems to be self-evident. If a culture like um, the Amazigh culture, especially in, let's say, Morocco and Algeria and Libya, just for sake of argument, or indigenous cultures in the Philippines, for example, if they start actually doing these changes, then they're showing a kind of leadership which is undeniable. So as soon as you actually see these um, texts, you sort of go, oh, huh, this is funded by the government. I guess, I guess it can be done. So part of the value of this is simply in overturning um, stereotypes that governments and leaders all over the world um, throw out without thinking because the notion of providing indigenous rights is more work for them, more expense, more trouble. And they, they, they sum all that up by saying it can't be done. And here what we see is leadership showing it can be done. Second thing is the whole question of how do you go about doing it is another question altogether. So about three weeks ago, I was involved in a, a Zoom uh, webinar with an organization in uh, northeast of India, which um, was really committed to reviving an endangered language in their region. But they didn't really know how to go about doing it. And so they'd invited some speakers in to say, well, this is how what you could do, or this is what's being done elsewhere. And I was one of those speakers. And what these, um, you'll see one right here, um, what these do is to say, you know, this is one way of going about doing it. So for example, some of the materials that are produced by Ericam in Rabat have different colorings that they, they've color coded instances where the different um, language families with, sorry, the different individual languages within the Amazigh family of languages, where there are varieties or variations, they'll show these different variations in different colors, or they'll color code the edge of the page to say, oh, you're in the north, this is how you do it up there. And this, again, is really important because of this, this divide and conquer notion. If, an, uh, if a government wants to say, oh, um, we, we can't possibly um, teach this language because there are so many different dialects, etc. And the fact is it can be done. And this shows how it can be done. So um, even if the efforts that are taking place in individual countries in North Africa to move towards gaining um, respect and teaching Amazigh languages and script are not yet there, are not yet as far along as they could. And I'm sure you can give me plenty of instances where um, they're not there yet. Bear in mind that I know um, cultures, um, let's say in India, for example, where the teaching of an endangered alphabet is being done by one person who has started a Facebook group. That's it, no funding, no support, one person and 20 people in a Facebook group. Likewise, I know a script in Indonesia where there is one person who in his own time is creating a dictionary in that script. That is a hard row to hoe. That is tough. And so whenever I see anything where there's any more support than that, I personally see it as, as cause for celebration. But as I say, um, my opinion really, uh, really doesn't matter. So what I'm going to do now is to stop in just a second and um, take questions from the hand up function in Zoom or off chat. Um, before I do, um, Typically at this point, I make a pitch for support. I say, you know, please go to endangeredalphabets.com, how to support us tab, give us some money because we need it. 
But what I'm going to say right now is hold off just for a minute, because starting in the middle of next week, if all goes well, we're going to start a Kickstarter campaign, which is going to be our most ambitious yet. And the whole aim is going to be to support the Mongolian people who, especially in Inner Mongolia, a province of China, are in danger of having their script and their language effectively erased. And with it, a thousand years of history and identity, folklore, writing, you know, their very sense of who they are. This is going to be a major undertaking. And I really hope you're going to support that Kickstarter campaign when it, when it comes together. Um, and when it does, believe me, we'll let you know. Um, so I'm going to stop my talk now, and I will totally be down for questions, comments, um, uh, insults, if you like, preferably polite insults. Um, so we'll take it away. And at this point, um, my co-host and producer, Alec, is going to take over the role of moderator. He's already looking at chat. Apparently, we have 11 things on chat already. Um, so I am going to do my usual thing, which is to take your questions, and I'll answer them if I can. And if I can't, I'll actually answer a different question that I can answer. That's my trick. OK, off you go. Your shirt is terrible. That was just a polite <laughs> insult. Um, there is some talk wondering about that textbook that you were talking about, if if uh, you have any details or yes. know where it can get a copy. Absolutely. So um, actually, I have uh, two of these textbooks here, and um, I have more over on the shelves. All of those were produced by um, uh, uh, Irkan in Rabat. So that's Institut Royal. Um, uh, du Culture Amazir Marocaine, something like that, I think. Uh, so basically, it's the Royal um, Moroccan um, Institute for Amazir Culture. So if you go to IRCAM, if you search um, in Morocco, then you'll be able to find all of the activities, which are not just text, but a whole variety of things that AirCam is doing. Um, the other materials that I put up on slide. I literally just a couple of days ago got sent by uh, Madgis uh, Madi, who is a calligrapher and sociolinguist and teacher who now lives in Ottawa, but he was involved in actually writing some of those materials. Um, so I will ask him uh, where um, those uh, materials are available, if they're available. Um, and then after this talk is done, um, I typically um, send out the link to the recording on YouTube, and I also send out um, the transcript of the chat. And if I have extra information that people have asked for, I'll put that in that email that goes out to everybody, usually because Alec is unbelievably fast at getting all this stuff wrapped up uh, within 24 hours, but certainly I would think within a couple of days. Okay, other questions? We have a hand up from Carlos. Okay, Carlos, far away. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor, for your for your talk. Uh, but I have a question, mm -hmm. uh, and it is relating, for example, to the possibility of the use of alphabets such as the Tifinagh alphabet to write other languages as a way to preserving the alphabet. For example, uh, writing my native language or writing English language or any other language in the Tifinagh alphabet. If that might actually contribute to actually help and preserve the, the language. Um, yes, so several interesting things about your question. Um, one is that um, this question of using one indigenous script for many different languages is something that crops up again and again, but it only crops up in Africa. There is um, something about this a spirit of Pan-African solidarity, um, which has led to a number of scripts being created or revived with the express intention of being used not just for um, the, uh, the language of origin, but for other languages as well. Um, second thing I would say is that 
you have put your finger on another really interesting element in all of this, which is that everything around language, whether written or spoken, comes down to a power dynamic. So the fact is that you could almost certainly use Tipana to write English or French or a wide variety of languages. Um, what you're up against is the fact that the powerful cultures in the world are used to everybody else having to adapt to them. And um, so the French, perfect example, you know, will bring in the Latin alphabet and you need to use that to, um, to, to write uh, in the Amazigh family of languages um, because we are the powerful ones and we can afford to tell you to do this. Um, and that's why in the end, as I say, um, uh, history is written by the winners in the alphabet of the winners. The dominant alphabets are not necessarily the best alphabets for writing other languages or even for writing their own. They are the alphabets whose users had at a crucial time in history, the most lawyers, guns, and money. So as soon as you start saying things like, oh, we could use Tippana for writing English, you are shaking up those assumptions, something chronic, and I love it. Okay, who's next? Whoa, we have 28 new messages on chat. <laughs> yeah, there's a, an interesting little thread going on, but first there's a question from Facebook. Okay. Uh, how can your organization help these endangered languages? Um, so that's a question that varies from uh, language to language and alphabet to alphabet all over the world. So I'm going to use that as an opportunity to say what it is we are about to start trying to do for Mongolia. So um, there was a time, as you probably know, roughly 800 years ago, when the Mongol Empire was the largest contiguous land empire the world has ever known. Over time, the Mongol lands sort of dwindled. And now the Mongols live by and large, with some exceptions, um, in uh, Russia, in Mongolia, uh, formerly Outer Mongolia, and in China, in a province known as Inner Mongolia, or as they call it, Southern Mongolia. So the Chinese government has said that um, children in Inner Mongolia instead of using their traditional script, which is 800 years old, as I say, um, should now start learning Chinese. And this is going to have as dramatically undermining an effect on the culture as you can imagine. And the Mongols are responding in this amazing way with calligraphy. So the Mongol script, which is a vertical script, and it really is a script. You can see the movement of the hand as it goes. Um, uh, the, the, the protests that they're doing are written in this, these beautiful vertical banners in these scripts. And they say things like, uh, a foreign language is a tool, your mother tongue is your soul. And so what we are doing is, we, we've thought a lot about this, we've made a lot of contacts within these different countries in the Mongol um, communities. And um, obviously, the endangered alphabets, which is basically uh, two and a half people and, and a dog. Well, actually a rabbit, a rabbit's over there. Um, we stand no chance in terms of confronting the Chinese government. So what we're doing is to say, what can we do that introduces Mongol culture and language and history and mythology to the world so that Again, it comes down to we are still here. So we're doing a number of things. I am creating a gallery of Mongolian calligraphy, which is going to go up on our website. Uh, we have an essay on the importance to the Mongol people of their um, script. That's uh, going up on the website. We are working on a, a card game that actually teaches the Mong Mong Mongolian script. And we're also working on another card game, which is going to be the subject of our Kickstarter, which is called Ulus, which is a Mongolian word, which means empire or land or home. And it's a, um, it's a cross between a, a trading card game and a, and a board game. And it's that the players represent um, Mongol gods 
um, and they take um, heroes from uh, Mongolian history or mythology, and they literally, they battle for the future of the Mongol identity, the Mongol lands, the Mongol soul against various monsters and, and challenges, etc. So the whole purpose of this game, as I say, is to open that door to uh, Mongolia, its lands, its beliefs, its culture, its people. So it becomes that much harder for anyone to close that door and to say, no, they're not really Mongols, they're just, they're really Chinese and, and they, um, they should speak Chinese and they should um, uh, participate in the greater China in ways that we dictate. Um, so that's what we're doing there. And again, it's gonna be a huge project and we need to raise a lot of money to do so and we're gonna be asking for that. Um, so we've done a variety of different things in different places. That's our plan specifically for um, Mongolia and Mongol culture. There's a hand up, but maybe before we get to that, uh, there's really interesting discussion going on. Uh, wondering if sharing a script beyond its primary users is cultural appropriation or cultural appreciation? Does it make the script less special? Ooh, so we've been talking about this in some of the previous talks. Um, we talked uh, in the Balinese um, talk, we talked about the fact that um, the traditional um, texts in Balinese, which are written on palm leaves, which are collected in uh, palm leaf um, books, um, kind of shaped like this uh, on the Lantar palm, they are venerated and they are kept in a sacred place in the house as a sign of how important that script is spiritually as well as culturally. But then also we talked about the fact that um, if you're going to teach a script um, and to revive it, um, you don't want to hide it away. You want to make it public. And so there are many cultures in the world which are starting to use traditional scripts on signage, for example, just like we saw um, in, um, in the slideshow that I was showing there. Um, the cultural appropriation thing for me comes down to two questions. Um, and and I'm, I'm imagining now that you're asking me this question. Am I um, undertaking an act of cultural appropriation? And those two questions are, one, am I claiming it as my own? And two, am I making money off it? Um, so I've had a number of conversations with the Abnaki in uh, the indigenous people in Vermont who are really very well aware of the, the issues of, of cultural appropriation. Um, and they were very careful to draw lines for me not to cross um, as I was working with them. It was a great education. And, and so for example, they gave the example of um, an anthropologist who came to study them and they, um, they gave him access to uh, their ceremonies and their songs and their drumming and um, their um, beadwork designs. Um, and so he went away and he wrote, uh, you know, an anthropological book about the Abnaki. Um, and then he went on the author tours and he probably his academic career progressed because of that. And none of it went back to the tribe. So to give you an example of how we're dealing with this, again, to use the Mongolian example, we're creating this game but then what we're going to do is we're going to look for a partner in Mongolia to whom we can pass over the, the files um, from which the game can be printed and give them license for free to then publish the game in Mongolia. So, and we've done this with other things. We raise money to, to, to create the product and then we turn it over to the culture so that they can make whatever use of it um, that they want to. Um, so yes, um, I am a huge fan of uh, cultural appreciation. And um, for me, when I'm doing these carvings, they are absolutely gestures of cultural appreciation. Um, I think if I were a for-profit organization and I'm gonna make hundreds of thousands of dollars off, you know, t-shirts and keychains and all that kind of stuff, I would definitely 
be, you know, kind of crossing a line into that appropriation territory. Um, but uh, that isn't the case, you know, we are a nonprofit to the max. Um, and uh, the, the, the funds that we raise all go towards this work that we do. So uh, Jamal has a hand up. Okay, Jamal, go for it. Okay, hi, Azul, how are you? Hi. Yeah. So I, I just wanted uh, to, um, to say that, I mean, yeah, Tifinar is doing well in Morocco and in Libya in terms of textbooks. And it's actually a script that is being used, you know, to teach the language. However, in Algeria, which has a substantial, I mean, uh, Amazir speaking community, yep. the script debate is not settled yet. And actually today there was a referendum in the country which is going to make the language, I mean, uh, I mean, if the referendum goes through, it's going to make the language for the first time an official language next to Arabic. But in Algeria, the script that is used to teach the language and is, 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 is Latin. So, and actually there's a debate raging on in Algeria now. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the state and the political parties, they want you know, the Amazir to use Tifina. Whereas, I mean, in the Kabyle region, and especially because there has been a long you know, history of literary production in the Latin alphabet instead of Tifina, a lot of people within the movement, the Amazir movement, they seem to want you know, the Latin alphabet instead of Tifina to write their own language and to teach it to their own kids. So that is one, I mean, thing that I want to know your reflections on. Yes. The second one is um, this discrepancy between, I mean, two situations where you have Tifinar being used to teach, you know, language to school kids, I mean, in Morocco and in Libya and hopefully in other places in the future. But at the same time, most literary production, like novels, poems, and there is quite a renaissance of that in Morocco and Algeria and everywhere in North Africa, literary production seems to be mostly in Latin alphabet. Yep. So you have one script being used to teach language and then people are producing like uh, written, like literary culture are using the Latin alphabet. So yep. I don't know what you think about that. So Got it. thank you. Got it. So yes, you're absolutely right. Algeria has been less progressive in terms of its um, attitude towards the Amazigh people and, and language in general. And it's also very clear that there are um, right-wing politicians in Algeria who think that they can gain popularity um, by essentially um, slandering or opposing um, Amazigh people. Um, and it's, it's always gonna vary. Whenever you have a people who do not have their own state, and obviously the Amazigh people um, you know, traditionally, going back 2000 years, the whole of North Africa was, was their state. But because of a whole series of historical incidents, um, you don't have your own state. So what happens then is you're at the mercy of other people. And the question is, to what extent do you play by their rules? And um, the questions that you ask are really part of an ongoing conversation along those lines. And as I say, it is not my position or my right to say anybody should do anything. Um, what I suspect is going to happen is that within each of these um, North African cultures, and even possibly in the Amazigh diaspora elsewhere in the world, you're going to get um, uh, small pockets or larger pockets of people who really want to pursue using the Tifana alphabet. And in some places they will gain a critical mass where you will actually get a certain amount of production, literature, literary production, journalism production, whatever. In other places that won't reach a critical mass or it won't reach a critical mass for some time. So um, there's really no way of telling and the climate in each area is gonna be different. Um, if uh, I'm, I'm really aware of the, the, um, the renaissance of um, Amazigh written culture, and um, if it makes most sense for a writer to reach the readers that he or she wants to reach 
by using this language or this alphabet or whatever, then that person is going to do it. You know, I'm a writer myself. I want to reach. I want to reach readers. Um, um, and I think that this is a long game. I mean, in it's been going on in Morocco since Morocco achieved independence, and that's a while. It's going to carry on for a while longer. In Indonesia, you see it's happening differently at a different rate in individual provinces. So some provinces are much more actively pursuing the, rev uh, the revival of their traditional language and script, especially the provinces where there is a lot of tourism. So there's a lot of tourism income. So there's money coming in that you can use to create products or to support teaching in initiatives. In other provinces, that's happening much less. So it's a moving target. The encouraging thing is that when I started the Endangered Alphabets project 10 years ago, people were still talking about failed scripts and uh, dying languages. And now the, 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 the whole notion of revitalization is part of the conversation. So how you go about doing it is gonna vary from place to place. You're gonna try different strategies. But the fact that the conversation is happening at all is a massive change just in the last 10 years. Okay, we are running out of time. I will happily take two more questions, but I'll try and make the answers shorter. So there's one in chat about the flag. Okay. Uh, if there's an ownership issue or, uh, so that it doesn't go through the same copyright process as the Australian Aboriginal flag. Ooh, what a great I didn't know anything about copyrights and Australian Aboriginal flag and stuff like that. Uh huh. Um, thank you. I will look into that and see what I can find out. Okay. Oh, wow. Yes, this, com this is the, by far the most extensive conversation we've ever had on chat. Okay. Um, Alec, choose me one more question I can answer. Well, it looks like the wells run dry at the moment. It always okay, I may add something to the to the to the Aboriginal flag. Sounds like Olish. Yeah. Go yeah, for it. With the, with the Aboriginal flag is like this story that apparently this famous flag that is similar to you know to to heaven covered in flames and so on was under the copyright. And after you start people started using it and really recognize it as Aboriginal. There was the there was a copyright, um, what do you call it, case and 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 it was banned. So it's just a question because Tifinag in the version that is now, it's somebody's co-creation, isn't it? Um, flag itself it must be somebody's creation as well. Yes, but it's also very possible that to create something and then turn it over to a culture or to the people. Yeah, well, my, my question is, was it? I, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to hear some from somebody who knows something about um, uh, the history of um, the, uh, the Amazigh Academy and, you know, how all that turned out. Um, okay, uh, thank you. There is an answer in chat. Oh, there is already? Yes. Whoa, this is... Um, Okay, yes, the question is, uh, hmm. okay, I would love to know uh, more about that. And as I find out more, I will post it and I will send it out to you all, stay tuned. Okay, um, I need to stop because I am running out of voice. Um, the next, uh, next talk will be Wednesday at one o'clock. I will send all of you uh, not only the link to the recording of this one and the transcript of the chat, but also um, the link to uh, the next one so you can join in. And uh, I am just so delighted um, that all of you uh, took part today and you brought all this information to bear. And as always, you found areas that I don't know anything about, which is great. This is how research is done in the 21st century. You say something stupid online and people correct you. So thanks again. And um, I hope to see you all again soon.
Bye.